Hey everybody, we've got a phenomenal show for you all today with Thaddeus and Tamaro, and today we've got Dr. Sean O'Mara. So Dr. Sean actually has this super cool idea about aging in reverse that made me super intrigued about what that meant and how you actually do that. So he's in his uh, late 50s now and he's seeing reverse signs of aging based on his protocols that he's using with his clients, his patients, and himself. So we wanted to get together and talk to him about what he's doing. He's a medical doctor in Minnesota, and he's got some amazing ideas. So check out this interview with Dr. Sean O'Mara and see what you can pick up to age in reverse. You know, I'm always fascinated at researchers that um, it's my it's been my perspective that you know researchers in the health space will you know be fantastically uh, deep on a particular subject and they are passionate about it because it's so important to health. Right. But then it's remarkable to me that they don't look at other areas. Right. Yeah. So right. these same people, like I just remember looking at this one professor who is like the most knowledgeable person on water molecules and the different phases of water and why <laughs> structured water is so incredibly important mm -hmm. for consumption to, um, to be healthy and optimize your health. And, and but the dude eats sugar and candy. I was just saying that you go to McDonald's for lunch. All the time. <laughs> he looked horrible, yeah. and I, you know I'm like, but that's isn't that the story though? Right. Of so many researchers, they they have this passion about um, this one particular yeah. thing. Man, I am passionate about it all. Yeah. yeah. You know, if yeah. I understand and research and I look at it and interpret it as a health optimizing practice, freaking I am in it. Well, I am doing it. And you know, or, or I'm eliminating something that's just the opposite. Yeah. You know, from my life and For having sure. nothing to do with it. Right. So I I think we need to have more people adopt that kind of approach. And I think you guys are, are that way. Yeah. So um. Welcome to Thaddeus and Tomorrow. We got Thaddeus Tomorrow. That's my pen name, okay. Tomorrow. But okay. you can call me Heidi as well. Um, so we're here with Dr. Sean O'Mara, and we are super excited to have you and interview you. So we would like to know a little bit more about your background, Sean. Sure. So if you can tell our viewers, you know, like what um, what you've done in your past, what you know, your medical doctor, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So my story is that you know I grew up in a. Uh, Pretty modest family in, in Washington D.C. suburb of Washington D.C. went to public schools, and um, when I got to uh, uh, my freshman year of college, I had a, an experience with a college professor. I, at that time, I wanted to to go into law enforcement. Okay. And uh, this <coughs> professor would read from the greatest authors from the first five minutes of a class, hmm. and my mind was open by those great authors and uh, the classics that were read to me suddenly were deeply attractive for the words that those individuals who wrote those literary classics were able to pen that it just clicked my mind that learning was a really cool thing awesome and so from that patrol administration class I started to study and, and put together principles and at the time I was at a community college and to this day that professor uh, instructor at the community college still is in my opinion the most valuable educator I ever was in front of so um, after going to community college um, studying law enforcement I went to Penn State University okay. and uh, during that time and while in college I worked as a police officer in, in law enforcement and I uh, uh, eventually uh, transitioned from <clears throat> working in uh, uniform law enforcement, do undercover narcotics work. So I have a background um, being an undercover narcotics agent. I did undercover uh, organized crime for a while. Um, very interesting. I enjoyed the challenges of, of going undercover. It's a little bit like being an actor. Challenges? And, it uh, seems like crazy shit, man. <laughs> it was. <laughs> it what? was very, You're you know. You're so like, it was really it, it is, It's a legit, you know, legit. <laughs> Legitimate uh, life and death kind of a struggle because you know if you got caught that you were you know a, uh, a undercover uh, agent yeah. it, it would do well so it uh, wouldn't go well for you so uh, right. I had a lot of harrowing experiences I would never recommend doing that at the time I was young and single and you know didn't have a uh, the five kids that I have today <laughs> right. so, uh, but uh, <clears throat> end up uh, transitioning out of uh, law enforcement into uh, 
uh, into law. I went to law school and became a criminal prosecutor Whoa. and uh, practiced for three years as a criminal prosecutor outside Philadelphia. Oh. And um, uh, in Pennsylvania, the judges are elected and the district attorney are, are elected. And so as a consequence, if you were prosecuting somebody um, who either the attorney um, that was representing them had made a uh, a contribution to the uh, either the judge's campaign or the district attorney's campaign, or maybe their father did, uh, or family member, uh, it was a different outcome. Whoa. And so I would receive pressure from my office to uh, deal down these kind of charges. But if you happen to be a uh, have not, yeah. like you were a poor uh, person without any money, maybe you were a minority, um, you had the book thrown at you. And I wasn't able to, to give any uh, kind of concessions. So th those were the political constraints wow. placed upon me. But I wouldn't play football. I didn't. I was not a team player that way because... You know, in my opinion, the you know the have-nots really yeah. deserve more mercy than those that has. I mean, if you're a wealthy person and and you're making bad mistakes, right. you know, um, I I didn't really feel like you know as much mercy for you as poor as the poor kid that never knew who their father was sure. and grew up uh, uh, eating uh, uh, potato chips and and drinking uh, grape soda, uh, and that was their their meal life. Right. So. Um, I ended up being kind of frustrated with the politics and of law and decided to, uh, to go to medical school and, and uh, take a look at that. And I was always interested in science. And so I wasn't that old at that point. I could apply to uh, medical school and I got a scholarship uh, through the uh, Army to cover my expenses to, oh, okay. uh, to, to attend medical school. And I, I just I really was very grateful to the military to allow, huh. allow me to, uh, uh, to do that. And so I attended uh, Temple University uh, School of Medicine after going to Villanova University School of Law um, previously in the Philadelphia area. After four years of medical school, I graduated and um, entered active duty to do my uh, graduate medical education special, specialty in emergency medicine. So another four years uh, specializing in emergency medicine and I loved it. You know, I felt like emergency medicine was the most exciting thing, taking care of gunshots and so like heart an attacks and strokes. you're like an adrenaline junkie guy. Yeah, you know, I, <laughs> I, I mean, did. I, I, I liked excitement and, you know, um, it, you know, good point. I I was uh, uh, deterred by anything like in the preventive realm. So okay. if something came in front of me as a physician that was like how you get more healthy, or reverse disease or prevention, I was immediately turned off by it. And I said, that's what the family practice doctors do or internists, but you know, I'm into, yeah. I'm an emergency medicine physician. I take care of acute strokes, acute heart attacks, gunshots, penetrating trauma, <laughs> blunt traumas, excitement. Right. And uh, I never realized that really where the excitement is, where my passion um, is most uh, fueled is in the realm of preventing disease and reversing disease. Yeah. So I. I've done a 180. Yeah. I have completely switched uh, after being an emergency medicine physician for uh, almost 20 years okay. working in emergency medicine. Whoa. I, you know, met a really healthy uh, individual that was extraordinarily healthy, and he told me about an encounter with. Uh, um, you know, uh, he learned about Sergey Brin going on a high-fat, low-carbohydrate mm -hmm. diet. At that time, it was the paleo diet. Okay. And he mentioned that uh, Sergey had uh, uh, analyzed through Google uh, the data on the paleo diet and how people spent so much more time reading about it. Mm -hmm. And it evidenced the fact that it was important to them. Okay. And the second interesting uh, fact was, besides spending more time reading about the paleo diet than any other diet, they endorsed it to their family and friends. Mm -hmm. So what that meant was you would never share something to somebody unless you felt right. like it had value and you're willing to endorse it to For them. Sure. So Google concluded um, that the paleo diet had real validity and mm -hmm. was uh, the best diet for them to, uh, to adopt. So Sergey Brin, uh, went paleo back uh, about the same time um, as I did around 2011. Okay. And, um, you know, I haven't looked back since. I've been high fat, low carb. I'm now keto. Um, and now, uh, presently, I'm carnivore because it's uh, the winter months. Okay. And that kind of brings me up to, uh, to where I am uh, uh, today. I like to uh, uh, share the insights that I've gotten. Um, from uh, originally looking at a preventive medicine strategy for myself, 
uh, to uh, a practice where I got involved, where I am here today in a research uh, practice outside of uh, Minneapolis and Plymouth, Minnesota, where we work with individuals that are interested in really improving their health, looking at interesting biomarkers that we have found uh, largely uh, through an MRI scanner to see what's really inside the body, not from the pers perspective of treating disease, which right. is how uh, most MRI scanners are originally ordered and, 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 and used on patients, but to analyze the body from perspective, like how do we make that body more healthy? What is inside the body that's either good or bad? And how do we take a look at that for the purposes of really optimizing it? So for the past, uh, uh, about five years I've been at this facility where we use the uh, MRI scanner to, uh, to do precisely that and uh, we look inside the abdomen to, to measure visceral fat. We'll look at fat around the heart, pericardial right. fat, okay. and we'll look at, we'll look at uh, arteries that uh, evidence atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease um, uh, obstruction and, and uh, occlusion of those arteries. And we'll also look at fat to muscle ratios, looking at subcutaneous fat, deep vis visceral fat, looking at the relationship to um, mus muscularity and skeletal uh, uh, formations. And, and then uh, making recommendations, like how do you live your life to eradicate the badness that's inside your body and grow some more of that goodness? So the, the visceral fat, people don't want visceral fat? Is that the, the well, thing? Well, it's interesting. Most people um, don't really know much about visceral fat. So when they come in, we make a recommendation prior to them coming in to just open source on Google what visceral fat is, learn mm. about it. So they're not colored by my perspective, which um, is based on my own sub subjective awareness and knowledge and research that you don't want any visceral fat in your body. None. It is the enemy. It is destroying your life. It is ruining your health. It's decreasing your appearance. It's decreasing your performance. Mm. So it's a magnificent biomarker to pay attention to. So what is eradicating? What exactly is the visceral fat doing that decreases your health? So like, if you've got a bunch of visceral fat, like, what what physiologically is that doing in your body to you? Yeah, great question. So visceral fat is an accumulation of. Um, adipose tissue. So it's a type of flat fat that's inside your body that's different from subcutaneous fat. Subcutaneous fat is kind of that you might pinch an inch, you can feel underneath. So you can kind of see the subcutaneous fat, like where you carry like a spare tire on your right. stomach. That's like yes, under the skin fat, subcutaneous right. fat. Right. So some, you know, some level of subcutaneous fat actually believe is good. Um, mm. it, it becomes a fat re, uh, reserve for energy that. Uh, uh, the body can readily use, and based on your lifestyle, and your 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 diet that you eat, and how you live your life, you'll either accumulate more subcutaneous fat or more visceral fat. The trouble people get into um, is that they accumulate this visceral fat and they're not aware of it. So visceral fat is deep within the abdomen, and it's underneath your skin, so you can't feel it, you can't measure it. And when you say you visceral fat, is it just sitting there, or is it like around an organ? It is around organs, so it's you know intertwined around your gastrointestinal tract. Mm -hmm. It's intertwined around your pancreas. It's uh, uh, around uh, around your internal viscera, your internal mm -hmm. organs. And so one of the reasons why it's so harmful is because of its proximity within the abdominal cavity uh, to uh, the portal vein and to the hepatic circulation. So this fat, many researchers now believe visceral fat is a living gland. It's like a, uh, a living part of tissue inside your body. And we know that it actively secretes cytokine, cytokines. So inflammatory substances mm -hmm. that get released by this fat go out and just ravage the body. It just causes a lot of problems. So, um, you know, people ask me, well, how much visceral fat do you want? You want none of it. You want to get rid of it. So we purpose for, to work with clients to eradicate completely visceral fat. So we'll quantify it by MRI, show it to them, and then we'll tell them what we have learned from over 4,000 scans, 4,000 patients, mm. what the best ways are to, to eliminate visceral fat. So we, we have identified about 25 different things you can do. And, wow. and uh, the chief among them, we're going to go through all 25. One of the, the most critical things I tell people to is simply stop eating processed foods and eat foods more whole in whole form. So um, meat, uh, fish, in whole form rather than it being processed and uh, vegetables 
vegetables are the one exception and and uh, mm -hmm. about um, about processing, but. The way I process, as I learn more and more about vegetables, is I recommend a natural processing, so fermentation. If you're going to eat uh, vegetables, I would recommend a fermented process. And there are probably other ways of processing uh, vegetables that would make them uh, either more bioavailable to us, where we can get their nutrient value, or more importantly, more safe to consume. Because as we learn more about saponins and electins and phthalates and these <laughs> other substances that are part of the defense mechanism of these plants, um, they really don't uh, have necessarily the same uh, the value that a lot of people think they have in terms of contributing to our health. In fact, they may be causing us problems. So you're saying for for most foods. So we're talking like meats mostly. You want to eat in in the form as close to nature as possible because as you cook it, process it, do whatever, you're you're oxidizing the fats, you're yeah. changing the protein conformance probably. Yeah. Yeah. And that may damage the body. Where yes. vegetables in the most natural form have a host of defenses for animals and plants to not kill the plant. And so naturally processing like our ancestors would have done with fermentation, soaking and sprouting, things like that, um, make them more digestible and bioavailable to Absolutely. our body. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So what, what about like grains? So you talked about like meats and vegetables, but and you talked about paleo diets. So do you recommend people eat grains? Is there a way I to don't. eat them? I'm not a fan of grains. I, uh, you know, all the nutrient value that I've, uh, that I've heard from people that consume grains, I, I can get them better from meats. Mm -hmm. And so I've just abstained from grains. And, and you know, I'll be honest with you, I, when I work with clients and I talk to other people, there is something about grains that people are just committed to eating them. Hmm. And I believe they have an addictive quality to them. Sure. Because it's yeah. one of the most difficult things to get people to stop doing. Well, and cheese. But che <laughs> cheese is one of those <laughs> others that's a little odd too. I, I, that's my addiction. I'm trying to give up cheese because I think it affects me negatively. But I had the same result with grain. So I knew in 2008 that I wanted to give up wheat to start with. And it took me five years of deciding I was going wow. to give up wheat really? to finally get, now I made my own sourdough bread every single week and it was like from scratch I got my I like took my own sourdough bacterial culture from the air and like grew it over time and then I had my own culture that I replenished and I loved it and I, I thought like I need to give up wheat but I, I was addicted to that and it took me five years before I finally and to, I haven't eaten wheat for the last five years I'm sorry for the last 15 years since I finally gave it up except one time when I had something from Europe to test out, do, is European wheat different than American wheat? And am I going to be affected? Because I was very negatively affected by wheat. So extreme IBS um, and anxiety. Interesting. But it took me five years. So what you're saying, like, why is that? That like, are they addictive? It well, might yeah. be. They're bread. They, they do. Oh I mean, my God, bread is crazy. just a, there's an intransigence with uh, bread that they want to continue eating and pasta and other um, other processed forms of these uh, grains that just they're super difficult for people to make a break from. My own experience. I mean, I was a bread maker too. That mm -hmm. is, I would make oatmeal honey bread. I would remember. Yeah, I make all sorts of different. <laughs> that that I would probably do it a couple one or two times uh, at least a week and so I was very fond of bread as many people are but when you get really fond of something you start making it yourself it's just like a higher level of addiction or in you know, a relationship to these kind of things <laughs> yeah. and and uh, when I went paleo I made a complete break uh, from bread I you know from that day when I decided I it was like a turned it off <laughs> I said if Sergey Brin is gonna do this and I was a data guy I, I you know it just it just made total sense I said this is the way to go then. You know, Wait, this is uh, just. He's the, one of the founders of Google. Yeah, for, oh, one of the okay. originators, founders, oh, okay. uh, and uh, uh, co owner of Google. I, I mean, okay. everyone's going to be share smiling at that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> what do you mean you don't know who Sergey is? Well, a lot of people, a lot of people don't. Really I mean, kind of stays, <laughs> to Sergey's credit, kind of stays in the background. So he's he's uh, he's kind of a modest guy. So he he's not big on. Uh, um, a flashy lifestyle, sure. which I, I think is, is, is also attractive. But I made a decision to make a break from bread and processed foods. Uh, and so I, I had no conscious moment of ever once cheating. Wow. I never cheated. When I made that decision, uh, all in. It, it, I was all in. And it, and it wasn't like I had to struggle and work really hard. It just 
kind of ha just just happened for me. I just lost my attraction overnight for these things, and uh, you know, was I you know 100 percent pure? Now, in retrospect, I remember getting started, and I didn't follow anybody. I mean, I just went high fat, low carb, and uh, I read a few recipes, you know, you know, like on paleo on uh, um, on the internet. Uh, but you know, I was I was basically <clears throat> um, compromising a little bit, like because we would make paleo cookies with maple syrup, mm -hmm. and I was eating these paleo cookies with almond <laughs> flour, and <laughs> thinking this is, so is paleo. <laughs> yeah. But I think there are a lot of people out there in the audience that that do that. Absolutely. So my perspective now is that you know I try to get with my clients that are working as quickly as possible to get them through the, the kind of a you know attraction dependency on the keto cookies and keto desserts mm -hmm. and all these other oh kind of God. things. That's a whole discussion in and of itself with yeah. the, so, the keto and paleo treats. So just I want to move back one sec to visceral fat, um, inflammatory cytokines, aging, advancing aging. There, Let's go, you said there were like 25 markers that you have found that can help uh, your clients or patients reduce visceral fat. We talked about as unprocessed food as close to nature as possible. And then we kind of talked about paleo, primal diet. Can we do one more? So we have three, like three different things that we've got uh, for helping to reduce visceral fat. Yeah, so um, one of the uh, different areas that I, I promote and I think it's really important to help reduce visceral fat is uh, optimization of the microbiome. Mm. So I think microbiome optimization is a really important thing. In fact, um, you know, maybe what I'll do is just show a picture of a visceral fat, oh, yeah. which would be, That'd be, great. That'd be really great. might be helpful Actually, for people to I understand. Have, so I have a question around that. Do you ever find like people who are, you know, like you guys, your trim that have surprisingly large amounts of visceral fat or is it so is it good on the outside but yeah. on the inside yeah. you're or is like, it corollary Whoa. with like looking you know more obese on the outside and then more visceral yeah, so fat so that does happen and so what we um, there's a term for that it's called tofi thin on the outside fat on the inside oh. so tofi is um, uh, kind of a characteristic of people that that might look kind of svelte kind of thin yeah. but they're filled with uh, visceral fat inside huh. so um, you know, for the the viewers out here, if we scan through the level of the uh, of the um, uh, of oh, the it's abdomen, glare, it's a glare. Yeah, nope. uh, uh, through the level of the abdomen through here, um, the lower image here in this particular area is visceral fat um, and an unaltered view of that visceral fat. And then up here, we've added some color to distinguish visceral fat as red and the yellow is subcutaneous fat. So we'll, we will measure the visceral fat in there and then I'll show you the benefit, um, which I think is fantastic, how much uh, visceral fat can be eradicated just from doing one thing. So here's a series of scans where somebody came in week zero, uh, we quantified their visceral fat at 5.6 pounds, but this is week two and they're down to 4.2 pounds, but you don't need a, a software program to quantify that visceral fat. You can visualize that this person lost visceral fat. In fact, their abdomen is less wide at this in, their, in just two weeks. And then they go from week five to um, uh, week 15 to week 25 wow. and week 35, and it, it's a significant reduction. They actually changed their whole shape. Now what's interesting and remarkable to me is this individual who is 68 years old simply changed their diet. They cut out processed foods and eliminated carbohydrates. That's all they did. and They didn't exercise one minute. And so, so that's amazing. No it, exercise. It is. So, so no carb or low carb? It was, uh, they went uh, probably low carb. They would continue to eat some vegetables that were probably had complex carbs. Okay. But we simply had them eliminate simple carbs in the processed form. Got it. So as a consequence of working with, you know, thousands of patients eliminating visceral fat, we got good at doing that. But uh, the same individual uh, we also learned could... Um, we could eliminate pericardial fat, which is the fat around the heart. So this is the right and left lung fields in this particular area. And that white uh, chunk of uh, white around the heart, right in the middle between your lungs is your heart. That big area of white is um, pericardial fat. So high, uh, highly inflammatory substances surrounds the heart. And um, in 13 weeks, he goes from here to here where he eliminates his, his pericardial fat significantly. Wow. So that was a big encourager. So this, this this gentleman got to see visceral fat being eliminated in 35 weeks, but even before that, got to see uh, pericardial fat being eliminated in, in 13 weeks. 
And then as a consequence of working with all these thousands of people, they started to tell us that, hey, is there something about visceral fat when you get rid of it that would improve your intelligence and help your memory get better? And we kept hearing this. And so we didn't know. We said, well, we'll take a look at the brain and see if we can find what that is. So we, you know, since we have a scanner here in MRI, we started to scan the brain. Yeah. We didn't think we were gonna see visceral fat or, or you know, certainly in a pericardial fat. Um, but we took a look at the brain and we did see something super interesting. So what we found <laughs> were these cerebral arteries. So these, um, these arteries kind of as the right uh, carotid artery and the left carotid artery coming up, but you see this, this haziness right here where the blood is nice and dark flowing really good here through a nice open lumen, very patent vessel, but it gets hazy right in this particular here. That's the middle cerebral artery and it's, it's developed atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. So the blood is not traveling through as much, but look at this area here that circled this, um, the atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease there is so large, the plaque blocking the, the artery that just blood just trickles through very little there. And this individual is at significant risk in both of these areas, especially here for stroke. Oh my God. And this process is atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, which is the number one killer uh, of Americans today, indeed most countries around the world. But what's really interesting is that um, by accident, a lot of things happen in science. We thought that it would take about three years, you know, several years to open up these arteries to get these this plaque out. But by accident, the, the tech that was volunteering here ordered um, uh, and a repeat um, a cerebral artery scan on this patient and they came back in 10 months and that artery opened up and so did this one in wow, 10 months. So significant cool. improvement. So here, this explains why people, I think, are uh, experiencing uh, improvement in their cognition, their it's intelligence, amazing. their Seriously? memory is improving because their arteries open up. And then, you know, evidence of this, uh, actually, um, if you want, you can see my, my so, radio. So this is, yeah, this is something that we wanted to talk about. So we, we talked to Sean, we were at a retreat up at the Point Retreats, and Sean came up and we were in the sauna and we were talking, <laughs> and he was, he was looking at my ankles, <laughs> he, was, he was looking at my wrists, and so then he started talking to us, you started talking to us about aging in reverse. Yeah. And it's like, you had all these little metrics just that you would look at visually on someone's like ankles or the bottoms of their feet yeah. or puckering of fingers. So do you want to go through just a few of those things that yeah, you talked so, about? Yeah, so you know, right away, you know, as the, the arteries open up, if you can uh, maybe bring that camera back and yeah. you can so you put a, um, uh, the camera and the resolution and the lighting is good enough to see um, my... Um, so we're, we're looking at, we're looking at Sean's my radio wrist for his radial. Uh, pulse, pulsating, the light may not be good enough because we don't have a, a good light there. And then a better example would be my um, my brachial artery. Can you see that? So, so the brachial artery and the radial artery. So on your wrist and, and then, then on your bicep. And then you can actually see it pulse through his skin. What? And you can see that, like basically as his heart beats and, and the artery forces blood through, you can watch that and he can actually count beats then right from his wrist and his his bicep without touching it you can just see it and so that's one of the factors that yeah you look so for. we see these arteries opening up in our clients as we we eliminate atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease we can track this in MRIs we haven't done MRIs which would be interesting as opposed to look at the in the in the periphery um, meaning in the arms and see how they they actually might be captured able to be imaged uh, by MRI but um, clearly the blood flow is is improving on, on okay. patients hold on I'm gonna stop you just a second so women have more fat on their bodies so yeah. like being able to see your blood flow would you be able to see mine because I just yeah. naturally have yeah. more fat so on my body of, it's a great question a lot of people think that subcutaneous fat is going to uh, prevent you from being seen at that particular area. But the okay. truth is, you have like almost no visceral uh, subcutaneous fat over your arteries and your radial okay. um, uh, part of your wrist and distant part of your wrist. So uh, subcutaneous fat really is not gonna pair. What, why you can't see there is two things. One, arterial compliance. So you don't have as much compliance to your arteries uh, as a consequence to your lifestyle that you lived okay. prior to becoming more healthy. Okay. And so your arteries what you really want to be very compliant to move like this uh -huh. so as the the blood is the bolus of blood is traveling through that you can see that pulse because it's so um, so resilient okay. and soft you want a nice soft 
compliant arteries. Uh, but instead, through the aging process and reactive oxygen species and cytokines and all these other dangerous substances that go through our body, that, that those the arteries start to harden and then they don't make that beautiful movement. So, you know, you can see these pulses open up. So, I, I'm super excited to be able to share these biomarkers with people and tell them, hey, this is what you need to look for. This has far more relevance to optimizing and improving your health than cholesterol okay. and some of the other right. nonsense people follow. So uh, I, I educate people to that and, and as a consequence to that, I also see um, as the blood flows, your greater uh, performance. Okay. So people function better, okay. you know, their brains function better, but they get better balance, they get better strength, they're faster. Um, I can run faster, a whole lot faster now than, than I could uh, eight years ago. And uh, my balance has improved. And a really interesting thing that's that's just started to happen is uh, I have now uh, hair regrowth on the bottom of my legs where I used to be bald. Yeah, so, so talk about this. So so you, the we, we talked about <laughs> alopecia or like or, or balding hair yeah. loss and so everyone thinks about it on their head right yeah. and then Sean's looking at my leg for hair loss and I'm like what <laughs> what's going on yeah. here so, so explain it's a pretty common phenomenon as, as males in particular age we haven't really seen this in so much females and it's probably related to t testosterone and uh, uh, the, the conferred benefit that females have uh, from menstruation and okay. the hormonal reproductive cycle uh, that con confers greater degrees of health on women until mm -hmm. menopause kicks sure. in so so you see the males have heart attacks and strokes, uh, especially heart attacks, before you know the age of uh, 45 or 50, we, okay. we can start having heart attacks in our 30s. Okay. Uh, but females uh, are, are basically preserved to later later after menopause. Okay. So um, as a consequence of, of that and the disease process that we suffer from more chronic disease, uh, you reduce hair growth. Hair just starts, we call it uh, alopecia of the legs, and it's typically in the anterior lateral aspects of the legs, so kind of like the outside. And that hair um, now is starting to grow on our clients because we increase the blood flow huh. to, to the legs. So the improved blood flow is doing something to restore the health of those follicles. And so, um, you know, I, I, you know, I don't mind sharing on the podcast. I share it with audiences that I have Asperger's. And some people think of it as a deficit, but what it really is, a I call it my superpower yeah. because I can track little tiny things that were happening to my clients here, were happening to me, yeah. and learn that, hey, these are nice windows uh, and metrics to follow. They're completely free and available and convenient that you don't have to do expensive blood work or expensive MRIs. You can simply track these changes. So hair is now growing on my legs. Hair is growing on my client's legs. And I'm looking for you know younger clients clients to figure out how we can do that maybe in the scalp to see if the hair uh, hair is starting to regrow on on their their scalp and another interesting thing that's happening is I've detected um, uh, a few gray hairs that start growing in dark from the roots and I mean I'll show you I'm, I yeah. Got this. yeah I'll show on the on the camera but this is the it's back so of cool. yeah. the back of Sean's right head here. and you can clearly see there's like a really dark spot of hair that was gray and it's grown back on the yeah. back of his head dark brown and it black. keeps getting bigger so this area is, <laughs> is growing out you know on previous photographs, it wasn't uh, it wasn't as as big and prominent as it is uh, today. So we're talking about like this aging in reverse, and there's these metrics, so like hair regrowth on the legs, and and get your hair getting darker from being gray on your head, and and there's all these just amazing benefits that that Dr. Sean has been finding both with himself, but also his patients. That as a medical doctor and as a practice that he's got here in Minnesota, he can track, and then he can kind of show what he's finding, and there's. Where he's showing us now a photograph of a yeah, finger this pucker. Is, this is my. Uh, these are my fingers. Actually, oddly enough, driving over over to the uh, uh, to the clinic, uh, you know, for the um, my practice today. Uh, my fingers were puckering wow. uh, when after I had gotten uh, out of the shower, uh, out of the my sauna, and went into. I did a five minute cold shower. Okay. And I'll just tell you, you know, it was that time with you, Thaddeus, oh. uh, and Heidi in the sauna. That I, we had gone and jumped in that lake, and when we went back into to, into the sauna, we weren't in there very long, and my fingers were puckered. I think we were only in there two minutes. Yeah. 
and my fingers puckered way faster than they normally do. Really? My Asperger's kicked in like there's something here. <laughs> oh my gosh. So what I think it was was the cold water that we went into the lake sure. had uh, provided some, you know, probably some heat shock proteins and just, you know, uh, it stimulated the smooth muscles. So, you know, we, you know, all us fellas, we're, we're working on trying to build our muscles, our skeletal muscles, but you've got these beautiful smooth muscles that line your arteries. And so to the extent that you exercise those muscles, you give a workout and you improve the health of these arteries. So, so how do you exercise the smooth muscles? So yeah. so finger puckering, like when you stick your fingers in water and they get all like puckered or wrinkly, that's what we're talking about. And, and that's how fast they pucker. And how fast. Right. And that's that's part of the smooth muscle arterial response um, in the capillaries, right, of our, our um, extremities. Yeah, in the skin. So, you know, puckering, the, the Europeans call it pruning, the British call mm -hmm. it pruning. Uh, but basically you get this wrinkly skin and it only happens oddly enough on the palms of your hands and the soles of your feet hmm. and it's believed to be um, a adaptation to our environment that confers a, a, a benefit a functionary benefit so that we can work in a wet environment and not slip and fall hmm. and we can oh. not drop objects so oh. the increased surface area and the puckering allows for a better purchase a better grip of these things so it has a functional um, hmm. purpose cool. and probably Probably something that we acquired through uh, the uh, adaptation you know with time but it's neurologically mediated so what's interesting is if you cut the radial nerve that provides innervation of uh, the ulnar nerve here which provides innervation to these fingers and you stick your uh, a small a young person um, uh, their hand goes into water and the and the ulnar nerve is cut these three fingers will pucker but those two won't mm. so it has nerve sensory uh, capabilities uh, as part of that ability to allow function uh, puckering but what I have noticed that it's not just nerve it's also blood flow so as you you optimize blood flow to those nerves that it begins to restore to a healthier level and old people begin to pucker their hands like they we used to when we were younger like now I notice that Whoa. my fingers are, are puckering again like they used to when I was a little kid and what is improving that puckering is is the heat in the sauna and also these cold showers so um, this is super exciting because you know you, you have to uh, this is what I'm passionate about you we have got to educate people to these uh, lifestyle choices like the, what I call interventions why you want to use a sun why you want to go into cold water uh, and you have to create an awareness of people to the benefits and also at the same time expectation you know, if you are not going to get, you be able to measure that and quantify how you are improving, how likely is it that you're going to stay in a, in a life, live your life where you're taking cold showers? Yeah. Uh, or you cut out processed foods where you, you know, eliminate cinnamon, cinnamon. I like, that song with Cinnabon yeah. the other day. That's like so funny. Twice a day. <laughs> so, so, you know, we have so, to educate people. So it's so it's exercising the smooth muscle tissue we talk about, which is there's this dichotomy always, right? So it's it's fit versus health. So you can be super fit looking, you can have big muscles, you can be really fast, but that doesn't mean you're healthy. You're just fit. And so there's this combination of being fit enough, but also healthy for longer longevity, life or longevity. Right. Or, or ex extended health span. Right. And part of that is like exercising these smooth muscles, which you're saying one of the ways to do that is a dichotomy between, or like a yin yang. So cold, hot. So sauna, cold shower. And that exercises the ability of us to be flexible in the, the temperature extremes that we're exposed to. But when we do that, it exercises these smooth muscles and, and actually builds health and resiliency. And then the problem is, most people like it's uncomfortable to take a cold shower i like my hot showers right yeah or it's uncomfortable to be in the sauna for 25 minutes right. because it starts to become a little overwhelming so if we're not giving people feedback in some way that they're gaining some something from it some benefit it's like most people might give that up and they wouldn't continue that practice if they just feel like well what am i doing is it helping yeah, so I think it's really important that people work with health coaches or professionals like yourselves uh, and myself 
so that they can be educated to these interventions. What do you, what do you really want to do? What does science show us? Uh, and it's not just science, because some of this stuff um, I, I haven't been able to find in science or kind of anecdotal things that I've picked up on, you know, like the finger puckering thing. Um, have you had, have you read or heard about that before? Or was that something you discovered? I haven't. I, okay. That just came up with it's me. So I don't cool. know any other. First old, time here. Like I'm you know, 56 <laughs> years old and this is starting to happen. And, and now it's starting to happen with my clients. But I remember, you know, the first time it happened, I've been in using a sauna for um, almost three years. Okay. And I would always go in the sauna typically same time, 25 to uh, 20 minutes to, you know, 45 minutes at a time. Okay. And never happened. And then one day I'm in the sauna and my fingers were puckering huh. after about 25, 30 minutes. And I was like, why is that? So, you know, my Asperger's, you know, I started analyzing the heck out of it. And uh, I remembered right before I went into the sauna, I had applied coconut oil to my chopping block, you know, to kind of condition it. Mm. So I thought it was media by the coconut oil. I was like, <laughs> wow, I found out something. I'm going to be bathed in myself in coconut oil. <laughs> so uh, I did a science experiment to try to test that, that theory. So I, I applied coconut oil all over to my hand, left this one virgin without any co <laughs> coconut oil, and I put my hands in uh, buckets of water. And I thought, man, I'm going to get finger puckering in the coconut oil. I sat in a bucket of water for 90 minutes. Nothing. Buckets. <laughs> no finger puckering. And I'm like, it's something about the sauna. Mm. The sauna is doing So this. neither hand puckering? Neither hand yeah, So it wasn't the coconut so oil. After 90 minutes So it water, wasn't the coconut oil. It was the heat. But it was the heat. Yeah. yeah. So you upregulate your perfusion. Okay. One of the things that happens is... Um, you increase uh, your blood flow. Your stroke volume increases. Uh, your your flow through your arteries is increasing. Your okay. perfusion is enhanced by sauna. And you know this is this is why you want to use a sauna. And there's okay. a lot of reasons, but you know you're you're increasing blood flow to these tissues. Hmm. And um, what's kind of interesting is my pulse typically is stronger in my left arm than my right arm. Hmm. And um, I have. Um, less gray hairs on my right arm than I do in my left arm than my right arm. So where I have greater blood flow, I have less gray hair. Uh, so I have a little bit of asymmetry to my vascularity. And I'm not sure where and why that is. But as I continue to um, you know, uh, live a, a healthier lifestyle, my arteries are becoming more palpable, more visible. And so um, my tissues are being better perfused. And I'm seeing all these weird things like hair growth and gray hair being reversed. I see you wearing glasses. Can you speak a little bit about has your eyesight gotten better? Yeah, have you, so have I, you yeah, um, sometimes, well, if I'm looking at something really fine, like details, um, uh, I, I, can, I can see this with without it. I just okay. don't take them on and off. But I love magnifying. I like the detail that I see. Sure. So uh, if I had surgeon loops, like in, um, you know, once, <laughs> once I get a little more money, I'm going to buy more expensive. He's surgeon just going to walk around with like. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I just want to see the greater detail that's available okay. in the skin to detect change. Got it. So I use magnifiers to kind of look at okay. look at people, um, but rather than taking on them off because I might, you know, very frequently I, I have so many interesting photographs that I just refer to them. I okay. want to show some small detail on. I'll, I'll leave those glasses on but to answer your question yes I have noticed my my vision has gotten much better now it did get worse and you might find this interesting the reason why it got w worse initially is I moved from a southern environment oh. from Virginia to a northern environment up here and I suffered from seasonal affective disorder badly when I moved up here the the darkness and the gloom uh, just made things really difficult but one of the things that improved my mood was LED lights, particularly the cool lights, like the 5,000 Kelvin light bulbs. And so when those light bulbs came out, they were, my hope my wife doesn't listen to this podcast, they were $38 <laughs> a bulb. Yeah, I remember I that. went out and, and <laughs> bought, you know, 20, uh, 30 of those bulbs. Okay. You know, a lot, you know, we're talking over $1,000 of these crazy light bulbs. And I put them all over my kitchen, and I'd get up in the morning, and I'd have two lamps with no lampshades, okay. and I'd have those two 5,000 Calvin light bulbs in front of me, while you know I uh, I was looking at my laptop, and I was drinking a cup of coffee, and it supplanted. You know, most people wake up in the morning, they're they're looking forward, they're like lusting for coffee. Yeah. No. 
I wanted to go out and turn that light switch on <laughs> yeah. and get those LED lights. So I would expose myself to it in the morning and then all day long at work, I had that, that light bulb um, near my laptop and I damaged the heck out of my my my, uh, yeah. my eyesight as a consequence. Oh. And I would go to ophthalmologists and they, they would tell me, no, there's, there's no harm from those light bulbs. And you know, to this day, I know that it caused harm because I can't look at those LED lights. They continue to really hurt my eyes. Right. If I even drive by an LED light that somebody has on outside their home, it's very problematic for me. But that damage um, is improving, <laughs> and I'd like to say it's improving because I'm optimizing my blood flow, because I'm optimizing my health, I'm reducing levels of inflammation through, you know, optimizing strategies right. that go well beyond diet and and well beyond exercise. Uh, to I mentioned earlier to to include optimization of the microbiome. So I think that mm -hmm. that is one of my most important objectives that I work with my clients mm -hmm. to get them to understand the importance of uh, a healthy microbiome. And I think it's going to be uh, probably the most important area of medicine that we'll be looking at and will be a part of our strategies to get people healthy. Will be how how do we um, exploit and leverage the microbiome to help improve the health very quickly and very effectively for people. So that's that's what I do right now. Um, it's still a black box. We don't know very much about it, but super interesting. There was a, a study in uh, uh, February 2009 in the, in the article in the, in the journal Science Advances where they took feces from humans that had uh, schizophrenia, hmm. and they took two groups of rats. So uh, one group of rats got the feces with uh, from schizophrenic humans. The other got feces from humans that did not have schizophrenia. Like they and fed it to them? They, they actually did a fecal transplant. microbiota transplant. Oh, okay. I don't know all these things. Yeah. I'm like, what? Yeah. Right? Well, oddly enough, rats and mice are uh, copophagic, so they will eat each other's droppings, yeah. which is how we figured out the C. diff. C. difficile oh. could be treated through fecal microbiota transplants because a group of, of, of rats that had C. difficile uh, somehow uh, got around a rat that didn't. And uh, they were eating that, that that healthy rat's droppings, and it cured them a C. difficile. What? Yeah, so, it was so fantastic. the so the schizophrenic thing though is more is more around. Um, I would think, is it like the gut microbiome being diverse and having the right bacteria produces neurotransmitters or or some kind of thing from the gut microbiome that we're discovering? Like, what is it about the gut microbiome that, yeah, that it's so doing? We're, we're still learning a lot about it. I mean, first of all, s serotonin is, 90% of our serotonin is produced from our gut. And it's it's believed that our microbiome, the species of bacteria, uh, fungi, yeast, archaea, viruses that, that inhabit our gut, um, that are part of that living community down there, totaling about 40 trillion, are part of that regulation. So my strategy is to get, you know, I tell people, your life objective for your health is to get as many of the good microbes down there as possible and the greatest amount of diversity of good ones and the least amount of bad ones you know, yeah. down there as possible. So when they did this to these rats and they did this uh, fecal microbiota transplant, the ones that, uh, the, uh, the, as it turns out, I think that they were mice in this particular study, the, the mice that got the feces from, from schizophrenics end up becoming schizophrenic. So it, it showed a causal connection uh, in a mice model for schizophrenia. But equally interesting to me was that these investigators could look at the sequence of the microbes in, in, in these particular uh, individuals and diagnose schizophrenia Whoa. by looking at that sequence. So this suggests to me the need to, to do more research to see what sort of other conditions might we be able to diagnose other mental mental health issues but other other forms of chronic disease and I mentioned to you C. difficile I, I, I had a client that was uh, one of the smartest guys I ever met when he he had actually read an article about that C. difficile in the rats and he was proposing to me as his physician that we do a fecal microbiota transplant on his on his daughter you know to treat her from C. diff and uh, I said yes this is fantastic. I got it right away. So I went to some other doctors that were working in our practice at the time. They laughed me out of the door, right out of the room. So there's no way we're going to do this. Well, 
they just didn't have the ability to make those dot connections right. that, that I could see in my client who was a PhD, who was an absolutely wow. brilliant individual, uh, not medical, but he, he could see that this was su huh. a su suggestive therapy. Today we do uh, C. difficiles pretty routinely, but what's interesting, again, with the C. difficile uh, treatment programs is we need to go back and data mine. What happens when we do this? When we do these fecal microbiota transplants, what else could we see going on? So in this one particular study, they were able to see that individuals that got C. difficile, for, you know, were, had C. difficile, were getting fecal microbiota transplants to treat this. A lot of them had Crohn's disease and it went away. So here they have inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's disease. They get a fecal microbiota transplant to treat their C. difficile and their Crohn's uh, either is improved or reverses, wow. you know, from this transplant. But even That's if it, so it doesn't cool. get, you can't believe it, it gets even more interesting. <laughs> that 11 of the people that got this fecal microbiota transplant yeah. in this particular study, uh, of those 11, nine of them came from one person. Hmm. So if that camera could show my hair standing up, yeah. what that means is they were a super donor. Mm -hmm. Now, I had always re theorized that super donors are in existence. In other words, you know, I tell people to optimize their microbiome. Those that are better at that have greater, basically, superpowers within their stool to be able to reverse oh. disease. Yeah. And so this suggests to me the need, again, why we want to strategize, why you want to live your life to optimize the most number of healthy microbiome, mi microbes inside your gut. And not only you got, but on your skin right. and in your other orifices and on your hair. hair. So I think the microbiome is, is, is a hugely important uh, yes. objective. Can we segue into um, like, what does Sean's day look like? So um, everything, you, <laughs> everything you've learned and what you've studied with clients. Yeah. Like, yeah. So like what, you know, like, what do you do every morning? How yeah. long do you do it? Like, yeah, do you mind? Great. So no, no, not okay. at all. I, you know, um, um, I like to think it, that, that I have a, a pretty good uh, pretty good strategy. But first and foremost, I say it's every day is a little different okay. because I'm a believer okay. in, um, in uh, variety. Yep. Nature likes variety. Nature likes a lot of different species of microbes in her body. Okay. And so I think uh, to that extent, um, I have a, a lifestyle that changes quite a bit. But okay. my typical day is I, I usually get up early. So uh, prior to getting up early, I go to bed early. So, you know, I get my clients, go to bed early, uh, get up early, and follow circadian rhythms. When you say early to bed, yeah. just define. So typically early to bed for me is 8.30. I'm going uh, to my bedroom, 8.30. No wonder we're kindred uh, spirits. My, my aura <laughs> ring from last night says I went to bed at 8.43 when I fell asleep, and the day before was 8.47, so. Oh, nice. <laughs> All right, kindred spirit. So, and, you know, so I will I will create the, the ultimate uh, sleeping environment for me, so I optimize my sleep. I get up uh, pretty naturally, usually before, um, I, I don't even remember when the last time my alarm clock goes off, you know, but, so but I get up uh, all by, it's by, by myself typically. You don't and have an alarm. I, I do have an alarm. I kind of set it up just, In case. it's already set, you know, kind of uh, uh, automatically. Sure. So I never turn it off. Um, but your internal so, clock is what you yeah, Exactly. Yeah. So my internal clock wakes okay. me up typically between uh, 4.45 and 5.15. Okay. And uh, I will get up in the morning and uh, uh, I will uh, usually have quiet time. So okay. I have quiet time where I'll do uh, prayer, meditation. Um, I will... Uh, you have five kids, right? I have five kids. I'll get it before <laughs> they do. They're, they're right. all asleep. And so I have my own quiet time alone. And then uh, typically I will have... Uh, some water with some just a small amount of fermented juice in it hmm. and sometimes I'll have coffee and sometimes I won't but if I have coffee or if I have green tea it's uh, without any su substantive uh, calories or protein okay. so uh, my typical day is one where I will fast um, for the most part until my dinner hour and wow. uh, so I, I'm pretty much one meal one a meal day, day. Mm -hmm. and then um, what I like to do uh, is kind of a feast or famine approach to um, to eating. Okay. So uh, when I when I do eat my dinner, it's a big it's a big dinner where I consume all my calories. And people ask me, and I, I don't track calories, but I ask me probably about three thousand uh, three thousand calories I'm throwing down between uh, uh, four o'clock and six o'clock. Okay. <clears throat> so I, I eat in a narrow window, and then. Uh, 
Um, I like to fast about uh, two to three days, two to three fasts, and I'll do that about uh, two to three times a month. So I'll a do some 24 extended. hour fast. Oh. Well, there'll be 48 to 72 hour fast. Oh. So I'll fast up, do that about two to three times a month. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll notice that I'll, I'll, I'll lose weight during that time, typically about uh, seven pounds. But I regain it because, you know, it's like I went out and uh, got a bison mm -hmm. and I got a lot of meat. And so I'll I will eat a lot of meat and. Uh, Are you strictly carnivore? Uh, during the winter months, right. I'm okay. strictly carnivore. Okay. Um, I will consume a little bit of fermented vegetables uh, when I do eat meat, and um, and then throughout the day. And one of the reasons I do this, and this is, I have figured this out, is in my humble opinion, one of the reasons why people uh, fail on a high fat, low carbohydrate diet uh, at times or any diet that they try is because of the microbiome. Hmm. And so it's my opinion that um, people are basically pretty intelligent. And why would an intelligent human being ever eat what they know is bad for them? And so my explanation for this, because it is, is, is uh, so perplexing, is that they're really not making that decision. Mm. That decision is being made by microbes inside of them. Huh. Why would it make sense for uh, a, 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 a species of microbes that uh, uh, inhabit our inside of our body to not have the ability to select their diet? Mm. I mean, they're completely at the mercy of their host. And so they have a relationship that, that we don't know exactly how it works. Huh. It's not evidence, it doesn't exist. What the evidence of his existence is, you can't stop eating those freaking cookies. Right. You can't stop drinking that, that sugary drink. You can't stop eating that pizza. Okay. It's this irrational um, uh, urge that you have to consume those foods. Hmm. And so to help people understand the clients that I work with, I get them to completely eliminate those from their, their food diet. And then so those, those microbes... So you're starving off the things You starve that them off and they die. Okay. And then, you know, important to the strategy is, is, is killing Pretty them by, by starving them. Okay. But you've got to send the good guys in to compete. So okay. these microbes are opportunistic. They're competing oh, sure. for resources down within that environment. So what if we were to put a whole bunch of really good ones down there? Like from fermented vegetables, fermented apple cider vinegar, fermented coconut vinegar, um, and even just our environment. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I, you know, we kiss each other, we, we caress, we exchange affections. Those, those microbes huh. are coming into our gut and to the extent that we get good ones, they go down and populate. But at the same time, what I tell, I warn patients about is the bad ones are constantly, they're ubiquitously present within our environment. Mm -hmm. So when you go, you touch a door um, that has been previously touched by somebody that is a, a pizza fiend, you know, a cookie monster. Mm -hmm. They're just constantly eating these kind of microbes. They're leaving those microbes there. They go in your gut and they go down Whoa. and they start creating those cravings again. So this is this that. vicious cycle that's going on. So you got to constantly shot. drink, you know, fermented things. So here I am, you know, drinking some, you oh, know, yeah. kefir, sipping off some okay. kefir today um, to get um, get microbes with, within me. Okay. And, uh, Typically, I will have small amounts of uh, fermented um, uh, dairy, fermented cheese, fermented uh, uh, vegetables, <laughs> fermented uh, substances of all kinds throughout the day. And I'm constantly building up a, uh, a team, an army, okay. that are good guys down there. And I have no cravings, no cravings at all. Wow. And when I use this strategy and I help people overcome their cravings by aligning to this entire strategy of optimization of the microbiome and then their cravings don't return and they don't yo-yo and regain their weight. What's in the jar? Um, in this particular jar I have um, just black coffee okay. and I have a little bit of cacao, uh, some cocoa powder, it's all, all organic. I have a little bit of cinnamon, a little bit of spice in there, a little cardamom. Okay. And uh, I have a little bit of a uh, fresh cracked black pepper. So oh. I will I will drink a little bit of uh, basically almost zero calorie um, black coffee. So to, no to MCT enjoy. oil, no bulletproof coffee, no butter. I don't. No. So you know, right? You know, some days I will add, um, you know. Um, 
bulletproof coffee and so I'll, I'll uh, add some grass-fed butter okay. or I'll add some uh, MCT or I'll add coconut oil. Personally, I just go with the uh, coconut oils. It's cheaper. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so I got five kids and, and uh, when, you, <laughs> when you're a health researcher, you know in this space, you know, right now we're kind of early in it. And sure. You know, it's just not, yeah. I'm not, you know, making a huge amount of money. Sure. I, I think at some point, you know, uh, I, it's going to turn around as, as we continue, continue to leverage the internet to uh, more effectively get uh, the benefits to uh, not just getting healthy, but optimally right. becoming right. more healthy out there. And I think, uh, I think things will turn around. But for the time being, I try to be um, a good steward with uh, my resources that for I sure. have. And, uh, and so I, I tend to uh, not get, you know, too processed or too expensive things. And, you know, I, I think MCT does have a benefit, but it's a little processed for me. Yeah. I just don't think we would have been eating. Yeah, MCT that's oil. actually it's one of the things that we've come to discover ourselves is the, the brain octane that's a specific brand name but it's actually c8 or uh, caprylic acid and that's a very processed fractionated form of coconut oil it's there's no way you could ever get that naturally and so we've gone back to the same thing we have a five gallon tub of coconut oil that was super cheap it's organic and awesome. it's just way better to eat the natural food yeah you know as much natural as we talked about before as possible yeah, yeah. what about honey maple syrup oh, sweeteners, yeah. sweeteners like in the summer or winter okay so here's here's my take on that um you know, I've just seen, I, with my Asperger's, I just see a piece of paper um, with my decisions. And there's a line down the piece of paper. And there's a plus in the top and a minus in the bottom on the other side. And um, I, I go through all the advantages and disadvantages. And to me, I just don't get advantages um, with sweet things. And I tell my clients. Even um, honey. Yeah. The okay. enemy tastes sweet. <laughs> because it's, it's been my experience, you know. Your, Wait, do your, I taste sweet? <laughs> that, that I hope your not. your blood sugars get elevated when you consume honey uh, in the same way, you know, maple syrup or sugar or you know, stevia. coke. Um, and stevia doesn't have as much, you know, as much of a bump. But it's, um, I think, uh, I think it's a warning signal. I think somewhere along the. Uh, development of Homo sapiens that that certain genes were acquired to um, with this sugary taste and sweet taste that makes us more attracted to it. But I, I think that um, either it's probably through microbiome uh, deficiencies that um, that it, this became problematic for us, and we just pine too much towards you know sweet things. So okay. I tell my clients you know stay away from it. Now there there are people like. Um, my my blood sugars now I can, um, you know I could probably tolerate uh, something that had some sweetness in it you know like uh, maple syrup or something and I don't think my blood sugars would go up because um, like my my uh, insulin sensitive is smoking hot. So like you know? Thaddeus last was it. Two years ago now. Two years ago, he had an entire pan of brownies. Well, so we put on um, CGM continuous glucose yeah. monitor for two weeks. And then to test that, I was in ketosis, but I tested it. So I came out of ketosis for a day. And the next day, I ate an entire box, like processed. It was gluten free, <laughs> but it was the entire like box of, of gluten free brownies, full sugar, whatever was in that box mix. It was a mix from the store. And my blood sugar never got above 118 uh, that whole time. It basically spiked a tiny, tiny, tiny bit and came right back down so it's just so i think it's insulin sensitivity you've improved your ability to uh for your insulin receptors uh, on your cells to function but i think this is um also going to be mediated in large part through your microbiome and, mm -hmm. and there's a study actually out that was done in israel and i call it the uh, the brownie ice brownie uh chocolate brownie um a study where they fed people ice chocolate brownies and you would expect people's blood sugars to go up but what they looked at were people, individuals whose blood sugars didn't go up. Hmm. And then they sequenced their, their uh, microbiome and they studied the people whose blood sugars did go up. And what they found is the individuals whose blood sugars didn't go up all had a particular same, uh, same strain of bacteria that were present within their microbiome Whoa. that at least was associated with um, better insulin control. Okay. So, so is that perhaps like that gut bacteria is eating or absorbing the sugars and producing fatty acids instead well so we don't know the exact mechanism uh, it may be that they communicate um, with our insulin receptors to improve um, our abilities to manage sugar you know the act, actual etiology you know, mechanism isn't understood it's just at that point in the study an association but i think we're going to learn at 
uh, greater length the mechanisms by which these these microbes are helping to influence our health. But wouldn't it make sense that there would be um, a number of species of microbes that would want to maintain the health of their host? And then a very interesting uh, species of microbes that we know about that have more inimical um, uh, interest uh, to, to our own would be toxoplasmosis, toxoplasmosis gondii. Do you know about, uh, so well, I'll just tell you and for the sake of the audience, toxoplasmosis gondii is a, is a single cell organism um, that is a very common in a lot of, it affects a lot of different organisms to include homo sapiens. And women that are pregnant are told to stay away from litter boxes because of toxo. Oh, okay. And so you can acquire toxo and get infected. It. But it's very interesting in this one particular example with rats and cats. Hmm. So rats intrinsically are, are terrified of cats. So if you get a, cat, a rat that has never been around other rats and never been around any cats and has been your pet and you drop it in where uh, a cat is around or it smells cat urine, it becomes terrified and wants to leave and hmm. get the heck out of heat, you know, get out of Dodge. But if that same rat is infected with toxo, it loses its uh, native intrinsic fear of of cats Whoa. and then it walks around in kind of a proud manner as though it's sexually aroused looking to me Whoa. and the reason for that is so that it becomes more more um, more uh, prominent in that environment and increases the chance for a cat to catch it because toxo can only reproduce its full cycle within the gastrointestinal tract of a cat so these microbes uh, recognize that it can't reproduce within the rat so they oh, bring about what? a scenario where, exactly <laughs> oh where this God. rat gets gets killed basically increases its chance of being killed but what's also is interesting is the studies they're showing out a lot of males, young males, that are involved in risky behavior have an unusual high incidence of toxoplasmosis infection. So young males that have been killed in motorcycle wrecks oftentimes are infected with toxoplasmosis. So, so it's like this, this wow. toxic, potentially to us, gut bacteria that comes from cats originally, but when it gets into humans, might be producing behavior in us that's not of us, but it's of our microbiome that's starting to direct the thoughts or the things that we are attracted to. Yes, and we're Whoa. seeing this in animal models where animals, you know, do fecal microbiota transplants and, and from depressed uh, uh, rats that have depression, they get a fecal microbiota transplant. They their depression is relieved when they they get from normal rats, and vice versa. You can do uh, depression anxiety by transferring them. And sometimes the personality traits are seen uh, from the donor get acquired by the recipient. And so there's a lot of behavior that's influenced by that. And I I recently um, went on a radio show and talked about. It's my opinion, and I think we have to investigate it. Nobody's nobody's talking about it but I'll I'll share it again that sexual offenders uh, hmm. are the responsible the responsibility be, be trying to be behind sexual offenders are microbes and I think the reason why people um, may be causing these sexual offenders is because uh, they do do the, the kind of behavior the same thing we see why can't they stop eating you know cookies well why why would they do something that's going to send them to jail well, I, I think these microbes are inhabiting people, and there's propagation of the species. Hmm. So they want to, you know, get into another organism, and we see this with sexually transmitted diseases that you, that once you get a STD, uh, you you become more promiscuous, and you want to have sex not with your partner, but with hmm. other people. Uh -huh. So I think these microbes are causing people to offend, to cause sexual offenders, and I think this explains why children who. <laughs> Um, you know, get get molested. They end up getting um, a, 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 get get these microbes during this particular encounter with this individual in, that's infected, and they grow up to become offenders themselves. And it also, I think, explains why we can't why we have such a poor rate of success with treating these people because. The truth is, they're still infected. We're not. We're looking at the wrong thing. The infection, Whoa. and I think this also explains why we have active shooters. Mm -hmm. I think That's you know, nice active shooters. <laughs> um, you know, they've never been able to identify a common trait amongst all these active shooters. And I said, well, it's because they haven't looked. 
I think that what we're going to we're going to find out is that there's a common sequence or common strain of microbes that's responsible for this kind of homicidal behavior um, in these in these particular microbes. And then if I'm correct about this, it it represents one an interesting marker for us to take a look at and start you know identifying in advance of these tragedies. Right. But more importantly. Uh, to how we can help these individuals to have this infection, to eradicate this infection and, and tr get them treated uh, through a probably fecal microbiotic transplant. Sean, are, can you use parasites and microbiome, or wait, what's the, <laughs> the gut bacteria? Yeah. Can you use those synonymously? Like when people say they have intestinal parasites or you know whatever. Yeah, in terms of exchange. Is so parasites would include any kind of li living organism. So ticks would be. But what um, you were just talking about, could you say that was parasites? Oh, so well, like an active shooter. Parasitic in behavior. So at least with sexual okay. offenders okay. and with uh, um, uh, an active shooters. If you have a microbe that's causing you to do that, I would characterize that as parasitic behavior, okay. a parasitic organism. Okay. Because it's now doing something that's harmful to the host. I mean, get you thrown in jail, uh, get you, you know, to kill other people, and uh, and so that that would be a correct use of that particular term. But you know, it equal to the magnitude of these bad things happening to sexual offenders yeah. and uh, uh, active shooters is the fantastic benefit mm -hmm. that these microbes play when we acquire them conferred through transfer of human beings for instance to become better performers so i think this explains in part the the kind of the team uh strategy that you see with athletes when one does something really awesome mm -hmm. uh, steph curry or lebron james does some kind of great move the other players flock up to him and high five them high ten them chest pump them because they're harvesting his microbes Whoa. purposely to get That's those so great crazy. optimizing microbes because they not only improve our health yeah. but they improve our performance Whoa. and so the future is going to be we're going to take professional athletes and do that in fact if you want to move ahead hmm. hang with some awesome athletes yeah. and to the extent that they've got high performing microbes hmm. you know uh, in them and on them you can start harvesting them and especially ones that are more like Tom Brady who you know eating more healthy Sure. you know having a healthier lifestyle you get a lot of professional athletes might be high performers but they're eating Snickers yeah. they're drinking soda they're eating pizza they think they're bulletproof well they look good they function good because they're young right but here's right. here's if we get these strategies right we're gonna push Tom Brady from his I think he's 45 to being one of the best quarterbacks in the NFL mm -hmm. I'll just say you know our, the future NFL players, the best ones, are going to be 50 year old guys with gray hair. <laughs> 50 year old women with gray hair. Because we're going to solve the problem of no longer being unhealthy. We're going to eliminate chronic disease, including in professional athletes. And what they're going to have is three decades mm. of playing football. And those young guys are not going to have that kind of experience. Right? So I'm super excited to work oh, with people to get them to realize cool. that getting older, it, you know, grow better. Yeah. Don't get, you know, don't don't grow worse. Right. You become more awesome. Get more healthy. I got three, you know, um, ten years, almost a decade now, of optimization of my health. Okay. Uh, Tom Brady has it, and you guys are optimizing your health. This is a super exciting strategy that I think we're going to see uh, headway with more and more professional athletes beyond just Tom Brady. And uh, I'm excited to work with anybody that is uh, interested in improving their performance, improving their health, because they're, they're just going to be that much better. So for lack of time, can we segue into a little bit of your workout routine? Yeah, do, and then we're going to have to wrap up. Yeah, we'll yeah. do two more questions. So, yeah. so the, you look at that? the last one is going to be... Um, What's your workout routine? And then, very last question, where do people find you? How do they get in contact with you? How do they find out about you? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So, um, my workout routine, again, is a uh, uh, variety. I like to do um, a lot of different things. But I guess if you were to describe what I do the most, it's really high intense struggle. So, when I became a researcher and we wanted to look at why people have chronic disease, we noticed that there's only one species on the, on the entire planet that has chronic disease because they um, there's human beings. And what they do is they typically do a lot of, uh, uh, either they do no exercise or they do a lot of exercise. But when you look at the animal kingdom where there's no disease, they just exercise very intensely. They have a violent encounter about once every five to 10 days with another animal. So we uh, posited what would happen to Homo sapiens, humans, 
if we adopted that kind of an exercise strategy. If we simply cut out all the chronic exercise and we just had them doing these high intense kind of in, in struggles about once every two to five days. So that's typically what I do. Okay. I will work out two to five days. And when I finish a workout, um, I'm wondering if I'm going to live, you know, during that exercise. I, I finish, I am so exhausted. It's like I fought a grizzly or I just fought another human being who was trying to kill me. So I, uh, I, I reach a level of intensity and encourage my clients to do the same thing where it's basically mimics what would happen in the wild okay. and what probably would have happened to us 30,000 years ago but before, you know, when, um, you know, we, we adopted an agriculture society. So that's how, that's how I exercise and I do, you know, lift weights. Um, my favorite thing to do is sprinting. I think that's a, a biological trait to really improve yourself. And, uh, and then uh, body weight exercise for, you know, uh, for about uh, four to five minutes, very intensely, I do okay. that and then I recover. And then for, you know, people that are interested in uh, working with me, I have a, um, uh, I, I'm on Instagram if you want to follow me at Dr. Sean O'Mara, D-R-S-E-A-N-O-M-A-R-A. Uh, and I'm also on uh, uh, t t Twitter and, and Instagram at okay. the same thing, at Dr. Sean O'Mara. And uh, I'm on uh, Facebook, and I have a website, uh, Medcon Wellness, M-E-D-C-O-N-W-E-L-L-N-E-S-S. -E -L -L -E -S. And I also have a podcast that I'm starting called the Health and Wealth uh, Optimization Podcast and a YouTube channel. So you can look, uh, follow my show, Health and Wealth Optimization Podcast. I work with my uh, partner, podcast partner and YouTube uh, channel partner, um, Eric Jungles. Eric handles the wealth part and I handle the oh, health nice. part. And we both work to optimize mm -hmm. our audience to um, improve their health and improve their wealth. It's okay. kind of a nice, uh, nice area of blend. So yeah. that's how uh, users and uh, your audience could, could track me down. So when you're posting to Instagram, Sean, are you um, giving people like snippets of nutrition and movement and like a variety, like you talk about variety, right? I do. <laughs> I do. I cover a variety of different things. Okay. You'll, you'll find that uh, I'll, quite a few of my posts pertain to the microbiome because that's something I'm passionate oh, sure. about. Okay. I mean, it's. I think the consequence of uh, not getting started and optimizing your microbiome means that you're just at a tremendous disadvantage um, to okay. really improve yourself. So I cover the microbiome, I cover exercise, I cover sunshine. Yeah. You know, I think we, we need to have more sunshine. You need to be out in sunshine, um, but you need to have an optimized body. So right. if you're eating, you know, pizza and drinking beer and, and you got a bunch of sugars and sweet stuff in your your uh, your body and you're, you're generating reactive oxygen species and then you go out and you get UVA and UVB and you know, IR on your skin, then you're at a greater risk for, for cancer. So um, I cover, you know, sunshine and sleep optimization and stress management. Nice. We want high intense stress and you want to be able to recover. You basically want to optimize your parasympathetics with your sympathetics. You know, the Chinese call it yin and yang. And um, so I cover a lot of these kind of interesting topics and I'm edgy. I mean, if you haven't figured this out, if you've subscribed, listen to this podcast, I'm not like your average doctor and I'm telling things that your, your average doctor would be like, or, <laughs> you know, very weird. But, you know, these are things that I've learned through working with thousands of patients uh, to optimize the human being. I love that one of the first things that Sean talked about when we came into his office was how he avoids shadows. Like, <laughs> is your doctor giving you that kind of advice? <laughs> <laughs> this is for SAD in winter, so we're optimizing our sun environment. Um, so very last thing, if people want to work with you, is it MedCon Wellness, or how do they find you if they want to work with you as a patient? Yeah, so if they, if they go to, um, I think my Instagram has uh, the, the website on it and uh, if you just go to MedCon Wellness uh, they can uh, reach me through contacts and um, I work I will work with any client that wants to improve their health um, but you know what I really like to work is I, I just think we've got to get our bodies um, as optimally healthy as possible early on so if you're somebody that is like highly motivated and you know I really enjoy that kind of personality so you know if you're uh, somebody that is in a position where your performance, your your livelihood is is predicated upon your performance. I'm the doctor you you want to consider working to optimize your biology, and I'd be particularly interested in working with you. Or if you're just somebody who's got struggling with uh, 
with trying to get healthier, I'm, I'm happy to work with you as well. Uh, my practice is uh, in the suburbs of uh, Minneapolis, just about 15 minutes west of uh, uh, Minneapolis. And uh, you can easily reach me through the web at Medcon Wellness, and uh, I'd be glad to talk to you. Can you work with people remotely, Sean? I can. So I have a number of clients that are from other states, and typically what I like to do is have them fly in, establish a patient relationship with them. They fly in, and we scan them, and then we can go back, and we'll have uh, okay. VTCs to continue to do that. But uh, increasingly, I'm getting more and more clients flying in uh, nice. to, to meet with me. And you're like really accessible with MRIs, too. I mean, the, the, you're not charging a whole lot for an MRI like that's no. pretty crazy do yeah. you want to talk so, about that real yeah, quick so and then typically we'll... MRIs are you know two thousand dollars on average I think twenty two hundred um, across the country um, but we we operate from a grant we um, our, our research practice received a grant from the National Science Foundation based on you know four thousand oh. scans of, of people um, to and so we received funding to reverse chronic disease and so we were able to afford you know offering these uh, MRIs because my my passion is to make people who really want to get healthy and really perform better, really get healthy, and really perform better, and it's not money. You can talk to my wife about that. <laughs> you know, not, I do not do well in the money department, but we're able, at least at this time, to offer these scans for um, basically um, $250 for a scan and then a, a consultation with a fifth uh, for another $150 to go through what that scan means and, and how it's to optimize unbelievable. it. unbelievable. <laughs> right, yes, well, thank you so much, Sean. Thank you for all this wealth of information I mean that's your wealth right yeah. <laughs> I love it it's fantastic so we yeah, hope to have another it. Yeah, conversation well, thank you for having you. me on your show yeah, absolutely thank you and there you have it everyone that was Dr. Sean O'Mara from Minneapolis medical doctor aging in reverse extraordinaire check out Dr. Sean online visit his clinic and then follow Thaddeus tomorrow for more videos just like this